Hey, what's up, Lawn Nation? Cam Dougal here, and I'm here with yet another bass player I've been excited to meet for a really long time, Hubert Eves IV. So you. you'll definitely know his work from the Erica Badu live album for sure, but also played with Will Downing, Seal, the OJs, too, too many people. <laughs> yeah, some yeah. recordings, yeah, back yeah, in the yeah. day. Yeah. Lot, lots and lots of folks. Um, so I know originally you were born in Minnesota, yes. but moved to Brooklyn pretty quick after that. And I know that your dad, Hubert Eves III, was a musician. Um, so what, I guess Minnesota's a pretty good music town. What prompted the move to Brooklyn back then? Um, actually, I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but we yeah. left when I was around, I think, five. Oh, gotcha. Right. So we, first we moved to San Bernardino, California. Oh, nice. And I think we were there probably for about a year. And yeah. then we moved to Brooklyn. So yeah. I'm basically a New Yorker. You know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Minneapolis is my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I still have a, a you know a ton of family there. Yeah. But um, I'm a New Yorker at heart. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And how I guess um, we'll talk about it. we got to talk about the Eric Abadu live record and and the gig in general. So how did that? How did that whole thing come about? What was, you know, what led you into the gig or what was the connection that kind of brought that together? That gig, uh, I got that gig from a call, uh, keyboard player, Norman Hurt. We call yeah. him Keys. Yeah, yeah. Right? Phenomenal keyboard player. Yeah. He called me and we said, hey, Hugh, um, there's this new artist. Her record's not out yet. You know, her name is Erica Badu and, you know, we want to put together a band and you know, do some shows and see what happens. And I was not into it. I was living in, at that time, I was living in Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't want to go on any kind of tour. I didn't want to be away from home and my kids and stuff. And so I turned it down. OK. He said, all right, well, you know, I'll check with you maybe at a later date when things start rolling. And he did. And I turned it down again. <laughs> and then the third time he called me, he said, he said hey, Hugh. This thing is going to take off, man. I really think this is something you might want to check out. Oh, nice. So I did. I, I went up to uh, to New York and did a couple rehearsals, and you know we started doing some gigs, and it just went shoop. Yeah. <laughs> like it was so quick. Yeah. You know, and people they just they loved her. It was it was amazing. Everywhere we went. Yeah. It was just you know. It's just amazing. It, yeah. it, it was just an aura that, that she had. You know, as soon as she stepped on stage, no one was really talking. They weren't looking off. They weren't like, you know, on their phones or doing anything. They were just like mesmerized. Just yeah, yeah. Her. Such a such a presence and personality. Presence, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even even the band, we're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like yo, you play the bass. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was the first gig that you did on the Erica tour? Do you remember what the, the first hit was? You know how some musicians, you can ask them like a question like that, yeah. and they'll tell you what city they were in, yeah. tell you <laughs> what they had on, you know, what was the big news event for that day? Yeah. I'm not that guy. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, once, once I do stuff, I'm, yeah. it just leaves me. For, yeah. I don't, I'm just not blessed with that kind of recall. Yeah, but I, I couldn't tell you the, the first gig. I just know that um, we were doing so much work. I mean, yeah. between rehearsing and performing, that it's, it's just, it was just like a blur. It was just yeah. one thing after another. I mean, she just took off. Yeah, especially, yeah, especially with her career. All of a sudden, there's, you know, everybody wants something from an artist. Like exactly. That, right? so. One thing that I know all the other bass players out there want to know, was it like playing with Poochie Bell? Poojie Bell, he just, he can make you sound good. Right? Yeah. Because he, he holds that groove so solid. His timing, his, his, his spacing, you know, where he plays a fill or where he doesn't play a fill. Yeah. And a lot of times, me and Poojie, we would just look at each other. Yeah. And just do stuff. Whatever it was. And it would just work. And we would laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I might, I might play a fill. Um, and he would look at me and he would just shake his head. And he would tell me later, he, he'd, he'd say, I knew you was going to play a fill there, so I didn't. 
Yeah. And he said, I just had to crack up because it was just like we would, we were just in tune to each other. It yeah. just, just worked like that. Yeah, you can hear it on some of the some of the tracks too, where you like you'll hit a slide down and he hits it with you, or and it just seems like exactly that's just locked right in. It's so. Yeah, that's that's yeah. us vibing off of each other. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's that stuff for me just made took that recording to another level because it's just Thank so you. locked Thank in, you. right? Um, and the other question I know a lot of people wonder about is. Were there any sequences going for that, or were you planned any tracks at all? Because there's a lot happening on that record, and not a lot of musicians on stage. Yeah, I get a lot of keyboard players come up to me, and they say, "Man, that, that guy—he wasn't playing all that stuff. He, yeah. There's no way he could play all of those parts." Yeah. Uh, you know, what did you guys have running? And I say, "The electricity was on. That's the only thing yeah. that was running because <laughs> he played everything. Yeah. You know, he had his his keyboard split. He'd have." the roads, whether it was on the right side or the left, I don't know, but he'd have it split, he'd have the strings, the roads, yeah. and it'd be killing. You know, very, very uh, special man, special musician. Yeah. Yeah, his ear is incredible. Yeah, and he was also the MD for the He was the MD. The project. He was the so. one, you know, Erica's ship, but she let him drive it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that's a, that's a really, you know, a, a cool responsibility to be handed down, but obviously when you've got the musicians you have part of that process is the MD is picking the right guys and obviously that whole thing just just gelled together for you guys so. he was a great yeah. MD because he didn't try to uh, to squash like your ideas yeah you know because sometimes we would come up with stuff it might just be you know sporadic might be instinct just whatever it was and if it worked he would say yeah nice yeah you know not no don't do that don't yeah. do this so uh, being open, I think that's, you know, because you can be MD, it's, 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 you're running the show, mm -hmm. but sometimes, you know, if you, got, if you got people in your band that you trust and they can bring a little something to make your job a little easier, a smart MD will let that happen. And, yeah. And he did. Yeah, yeah, letting go of that control and letting things happen, right? Is, mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously, you can hear that on the record, right? Like, you can, you can tell nobody said, hey, Play this here. You can tell that was you know, no, no. I mean, there, there, were, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were moments. I mean, there was. I'm sure there were times when he may say, "Nah, that doesn't work." Whatever. But for the yeah. most part, open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that it's it's cool because that really comes through on the record for yeah, sure. Definitely. Yeah. Um, specific question, which is, I'm really interested in. I've obviously I've listened to that record a ton, and your so your slap technique. I always wondered if it's a little bit influenced by synth bass players, just because I've I've found when I listen that you you play a, a little bit more staccato than the average person on the like on the pops and even on some of the slap notes was the mm -hmm. was playing synth bass and maybe even being a drummer a bit of an influence on that or where did you guess where did you pick slap up or what was your influence for that? I would say probably uh, drums. Okay. It's like a, a big influence. Um, I mean, my main influence coming up as a kid was, was Bootsy. That's, nice. I used to call myself Hutsy right? <laughs> when I was a kid. Oh, I, I had big glasses, <laughs> and I used to walk around the house. I had a silver jacket, and you know, I had a collar of belly bass. Yeah. And, um, but I think, because what I used to do, I used to take, I would have three tape recorders. Oh, okay. And I used to, that was my multi-track. Yeah. So I would play something rhythmic on, on bass to, to emulate drums. Yeah. And then I'd play whatever I wanted, you know, for the bass. And I would just overdub stuff like that. Yeah. You know, play one, one tape recorder, the other one records, and you play that one, the other one records. Yeah. I, that's how I started doing that. Oh, nice. Mm hmm that's, And I guess which instrument came first for you? Was it bass or drums? Drums was my first instrument. Okay. Yeah. I started yeah. playing drums. Uh, I was introduced to drums when I was about three or four. Oh, nice. And... Uh, love drums and I, I stuck with it and I played till I was around maybe 15 yeah something like that and I I, I just dropped I got sick of it I got I don't know what it was yeah. I just wanted to play bass ah. I was in a yeah. band yeah. <laughs> the band was called Starburst yeah okay and whenever uh, we would take a break the bass player would sit on my drums and I would go play you know messing around mm -hmm. with his bass yeah and I think right now he's a, a He's a drummer, 
Oh, really? Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and, and I'm playing bass. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, just kind of worked out like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Did you have, um, I mean, with your father being a musician, did you have, like, a formal music education? Did you have any teachers when you were a kid that kind of brought you up on either instrument? Um, for, for one year, I took guitar lessons. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, I, didn't, I didn't stick with it. Electric guitar, I didn't stick with it. Yeah. Uh, my dad ended up getting me, I had two private lessons yeah. uh, on bass, yeah. which was cool. But I don't know what happened to that, to that guy. He was, he was a great bass player. <laughs> but I don't remember. I don't know why we, I stopped getting lessons. I don't know what happened. Yeah, just disappeared. But from that point on, it was just, you know, playing with, just playing with people, playing with records and, and uh, you know, in high school and stuff like that. But in terms of, like, reading music and, I can read, I'm not a great reader. Yeah. But I, I mean, I can read music, but yeah. by no means would I say, okay, give me the chart, let's hit the stage, and I'm going a, I'm to a hit it from beginning to end. Yeah. Plot. <laughs> yeah. Not going to happen. Yeah. Um, I can read chord charts, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, and, fair enough. Um, that's that's about it. Just kind of play by ear. Yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And you, I, you had said that your dad obviously was one one of your biggest influences or your biggest influence. The biggest. And you know, for guys out there that might not know, your dad was a session keyboard player. Sure. Played with M. Toomey and was part of the half of the duo of D Train, if yes. I'm correct on that. Um, what what kind of stuff? would you say that he taught you and what's maybe the most important thing you learned about playing music from your dad? The most important thing that I, that I could recall, because it's still with me, is um, to listen, right? Yeah. Listen to what's going on. You know, you, you're, everyone up there has a purpose. It's not about you, right? We're, we're collectively trying to say something yeah. and everyone takes a turn. So he taught me to, to listen, to leave space, to look for the gaps, you know, uh, especially like in terms of playing fills. Um, you kind of want to kind of anticipate what's going to happen, right? In music, and it's kind of it's, to me, it's kind of like in life. You you don't just live in the moment. There's certain things you want to try to anticipate. Okay, later I'm going to have to do this, or I'm going to have to go do that. And sometimes in music, you if I'm playing bass. Sometimes I can anticipate, okay, I think the drummer is going to do this here, so I'm not going to play a fill right here. I'm going to yeah. lay out. It's something that you just kind of naturally kind of fill. Yeah. And I can do that now, I think, because of the preparation that I got from my dad. You know, yeah. Jamming with him and him hiring me to play on records that he was producing you know, when I was really, really young, and I would go in there overplaying, yeah. you know, <laughs> didn't know the song, and yeah. whether it was drums or bass, and he would say, no, hold on, you gotta, like me and you were talking off camera about, yeah. you know, bass players playing three and four notes and, and grooving off that yeah. and making you feel it. Yeah. I, I learned that from him. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's like the, it's what our instrument's for, right? It's to get the heads nodding and, and hold the groove together. Exactly. If, if we don't have that, everything else is just kind of, you know, we got the icing but no cake to put it on. Yes, <laughs> yes. For sure. Um, you mentioned doing, uh, you know, quite a bit of work with your dad on some sessions that he was doing. So who are some of the, the artists you got to play with or, you know, play on records with through working with your dad on those? Uh, one was Jocelyn Brown, okay. singer. Yeah. I think the song was called Ego Maniac. <laughs> Honest. I played bass on that. Yeah. Uh, I played on a lot of the D Train songs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I played on a, a cut called In Your Eyes. Yeah. Um, which I also co wrote with my dad. Yeah. And uh, D Train, James Williams. So your dad was a session keyboard player and did some work with M. Toomey. What are some of the M. Toomey tracks that he played on? <laughs> yeah, um, back then they were kind of like. A rhythm section that they were killing, man. They were doing and Tume and Reggie Lucas. Yeah. They uh, handled the production, but the band, uh, they were incredible. They they did Stephanie Mills, Phyllis Hyman, um, some stuff for Roberta Flack. 
uh, and of course, and Tume, the band. Yeah. Um, you know, they they were really really funky. You know, yeah. They, they, yeah they, for a minute, they were kind of like, they were to me, they they were it. They were yeah. it in terms of a rhythm section. Yeah, know? for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah, killer band. And just for the you know the folks at home, if you haven't checked it out, your dad's got a, his own solo record. I think came out in like '77. I remember that sounds about right yeah it's called esoteric funk and it is just an absolutely beautiful record beautiful vocals and and piano um so check that out for sure coming like coming into the erica gig a lot of gigs can be different depending on the md and the artist but um obviously you know a ton of us bass players absolutely love what you did on that record Thank love you. the playing on it um was the direction you know, did they did they want you basically just to do your own thing and make the tracks yours, or was there certain things that they were really stuck on? You know, this has to be that way. Uh, pretty much. You know, it was just the three of us up there. Yeah. Poojie Bell. Yeah. Yeah. Love Poojie. <laughs> yeah. Woo. Yeah. And uh, Keys. Yeah. And of course, you know, our background singers. Yeah. Lovely, talented singers, and Erica, but Erica was kind of like a, a free spirit. Mm -hmm. she, she knows exactly what she wants, and she definitely knows what she doesn't want. Yeah. So, um, and Keys, he kind of, you know, he was the one running the show musically for the most part. Yeah. And uh, he would give us a direction, but he would let, let us do our thing. Yeah. You know, a, lot of, a lot of stuff just happened on stage, yeah. you know, each one of us, we were just kind of vibing. Off, yeah. off of each other and things would happen and we would make adjustments to things and rehearsals and sound checks but pretty much it was just like just just go just nice. do do what you got to do and if, if Erica didn't like something she would either say something at the sound check or, or rehearsal or yeah. keys would but for like I said for the most part we were just we were just vibing vibing off of each other nice and you were at the time you were playing a music man is that I think when I first got that gig, I was playing a white music man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then I ended up, I think I went to MTD after that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah. Was there, when you were playing the music man, had there been an inspiration for the, for the choice of that bass or was it just a bass you picked oh. up and... I saw the bass, yeah. I thought it was a beautiful bass and it, <laughs> it sounded good. Nice. And I, I bought it. Yeah. You know? nice. Yeah. But I remember going to uh, Rudy's Music Shop. Yeah. I had actually went there to, to purchase a Zahn bass. Oh, yeah. 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 I had just enough money yeah. for the Zahn. And, and my, my guy that works there, uh, his name is Dean. Yeah. You, do you know Dean? No, not, uh, not well. <laughs> he, he's a great bass player, too. Oh, nice. Yeah, he's a really good bass player. Yeah. And uh, he said, Zahn, yeah, that's really nice, man. But have you ever played uh, MTD? And I said, no. Never. Oh, wow. He goes, really? I said, uh, you should, he said, you should check it out. Okay. I said, all right, I'll check it out. And I played it and it blew me away. That was it? It blew me away. Yeah. And I was like, I gotta get this bass. Yeah. And I saw the price, so I put it back. <laughs> 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 yeah, that'll happen. Yeah. yeah. And I was asking him, I said, look, does, does Mike, does he do endorsements? You know, is, it, is he somebody that I can talk to? And, and he was like, yeah, you know, maybe you can talk to him. I don't know if he does endorsements. You know, as we're talking, guess who walks in? Oh, really? Mike Tobias. No way. He was making yeah. a, a delivery. He, he brought some bases in. Yeah. And uh, Dean introduced me to him. And yeah. He spoke. And you know he didn't give me anything. Yeah. <laughs> but but we we worked out something that we were both comfortable with. Yeah. And um, I've been playing MTD ever since. Yeah. I mean that's my MTD is it covers everything. Yeah. A lot Absolutely. of bass. Yeah. And there I yeah. uh, I owned one briefly and uh, the clarity on those like yeah. the playability and just you can get as high up in the register as you want and it's the same as right so. And it holds yeah. the bottom, and that's the, you know yeah. that's where I'm at. You know, yeah. I, I really like just the fullness, the fat, you know, sound that you can get out of that thing. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And that, um, like you said, Bootsy was a, a huge inspiration oh, yeah. when you were first learning. Were there are there other guys maybe along the way that you started really getting into? Um, 
You know, the, the usual suspects. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your Marcus, your Byron Miller. Uh, I really like Seiko Bunch. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Victor Wooten. But I yeah. also have just, like, friends that I grew up with who are just, like, they, they may not be household names. Not everybody may not know them. But, you know, these guys, you know, you got, you got Ron Long, Jerry Brooks. I don't know if you know these guys. Yeah. But um, there's so many of them. So I don't want to name everybody. I don't want nobody yeah. getting mad at me. <laughs> yeah. I would just say, New York, all you guys that know me, you know that I got love for you. And I can't mention everybody's name. I'm probably not going to remember right yeah. now. Anyway. <laughs> but there's some bad yeah. boys here. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Along with all of the usual you know, suspects that we all come up listening to. Yeah. But you can, like we were talking earlier, you can walk into any club and just... Yeah, be surprised and find you see somebody in there burning there. and you might yeah. not even know who he is yeah. you know absolutely a friend of mine um, had moved to New York to study with Randy Brecker at one point he's a trumpet player and he told me the story where he moved down he'd been here a week or something and he was in his apartment practicing trumpet and he'd ordered a pizza and the pizza came and he opens the door and the guy says, oh, you're, you're a horn player. He's like, yeah. He says, oh, I am too. Can I try your horn? He says, yeah, sure. And he said the pizza man demolished him. <laughs> so, wow. so he said that's the, you know, that's the caliber that you're looking at in New York is it's just you never know who's You who's never know. What, you right? Don't ever turn your head up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might get your feelings hurt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. big time. <laughs> Somebody might come to you with a UPS uniform on and say, hey, let me, can I check your bass out? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Burn you right off your instrument. Yeah, yeah. Everybody is just just walk and be humble. That's that's yeah. that's my motto. Be humble. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's a really important yeah. motto for anybody. Sure, really. absolutely. Um, I, you know, after the like after the Erica gig, obviously, you, I think you got a little bit more into the writing and production after that whole thing had come through. Um, you, but that's something you started obviously when you were younger, and was that a bit influenced from working with your dad? Obviously, you were a co-writer on some of that stuff as well. It definitely started from from uh, from at home watching my dad, because my dad yeah. always had equipment in the house. You know, yeah. he always had had a, a studio in the house, and um, whenever he would record, I'd be right there watching and listening, and and you know, helping and learning. Yeah. And it got to a point to where. Um, you know, we would always jam together. You yeah. know, this is this is when I was really playing drums. I wasn't yeah. even playing bass at the time. And we were always jamming, and he would be recording, and I would be helping him. You know, he would tell me to push this button or do that or whatever. And it got to a point to when when he wasn't home, yeah. I would sneak in there and turn stuff on and start. Oh, nice. And yeah. this was back when everything was analog. So I was changing all his settings, and everything was all messed up. He would come home. <laughs> <laughs> He calls me Little Hugh. Yeah. Little Hugh, <laughs> come here for a minute. I go downstairs in the basement. I'm like, what? He goes, were you messing with this? You know, with my, he had a Moog or whatever it was. He said, you, you changed all my settings. And I, you know, I forgot to put it back, that yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. And um, he's like, OK, you want to start using this stuff, you got to learn how to do it the right way. So he gave me a stack of manuals. He's oh, wow. like, don't touch this stuff unless you read these manuals. OK. So I took the manuals. and. Put them off to the side. I never read them. You know, I told them I, yeah, I would read them. Yeah, yeah. And I would still sneak down there and, you know, and I was writing songs, doing, you know, yeah. just, you know, multi tracking. Yeah. Just, just from watching, you know, it was something that I loved doing. And then I remember he, he gave me, uh, it was a Fostex X15. Oh, nice. Four track cassette yeah. recorder. That was my first multi track recorder. Oh, nice. I, tore that thing up. I was always <laughs> writing and bouncing and bouncing tracks and yeah. And uh, I just kept rolling from there, you know, different Tascam 688, you know. This this yeah. stuff I remember cuz I, I loved it. I yeah. Really, I was All really into it. Yeah. Yeah. Just the writing and production, I think um I mean, I love playing and I'm I'm always that's going to be my my first love, but I really really like being in the studio. Yeah. You know? I like to be able to to have a concept and and make it happen. Yeah. It's, nothing feels better than yeah. that to me. It's, uh, somebody had said something about that, like you're sitting there with nothing and all of a sudden, a few minutes later, you've got something and you just yeah. keep building on it and then you can do that whole thing over again. And that, I guess, like you, I think you mentioned the term creative mind earlier, yes. but 
creative mind. You just want to keep putting stuff out there, right? So. Especially when it comes from like a thought, like you, you might be on a train, you might be walking and I'll hear a melody or something and I'll usually, I might sing it into my, into my watch or my phone or whatever. Yeah. And I, and I can pretty much hear, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this done here, I'm going to have this done and this is going to be nice and you kind of, you hear it, you see it. And some things I can do myself and, but as I've gotten older, <clears throat> I don't want to play drums on my stuff. Yeah. I can if I want to, but I don't want too much of myself on, on, on my production. Yeah. I, I like to include uh, other people so they can bring another, another flavor. Yeah. Um, so it's just not too much of, of, of me. Yeah. Right? And I think that it makes my job easier as a, as a producer, you know? Because if I'm doing everything, I'm going to want to like it because yeah. I did it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to and, give yourself trouble. Yeah, yeah. sometimes <laughs> you might be off the mark. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's better for me when I can sit back and say, okay, no, don't, don't play that there or play this here or, or you got it. You, you nailed it. You know, that's, yeah. that's where I'm at. I, I, I really enjoy doing that. Yeah. And you did, we talked about this a bit earlier, but you did a record that I really loved, the Alyssa Ori record, which there's some things you told me today that I didn't know about it. So can you tell us a little bit about that record? Yeah, well, that's my wife, Elisa Ori, the beautiful Ori. I call her Oreo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was the first project that, that uh, her and I had worked on together. Yeah. And she has a jazz background. And when we worked on it, I'm coming from more of an R&B funk kind of yeah. background. I remember her saying to me, we did a, we did a, I don't remember the name of the song, but one of the songs, it was a jazz standard, and yeah. I made it more into an R and B kind of feel. Uh, blue and green. Might have been blue and yeah. green. Yeah. Yeah. And she says to me, I don't think you really understand uh, <laughs> where I need this to go, yeah. and I'm like, well. Uh, Maybe, but I'm kind of hearing it. You want me to do this in a, a R&B R &B kind of way. This is kind of like where I hear it. And let's just have an open mind, both of us. You know, yeah. let's, I'll try to come closer to what you want. And yeah. you just give me a chance. Let's, let's see what happens. Yeah. And I think it came out really nice. I yeah. mean, no one really heard the record yeah. as, as far as I know. Yeah. But obviously, I, I might have to correct that because you heard it. Yeah, you heard it, and you, yeah. you're bringing it up now. So. Yeah, no, I, bad I humor. Mean, for anybody watching, if you haven't heard that record, check it out. It's a great record, and the playing. I mean, we're low end nation bass community, but the playing on it is is heavy. <laughs> Thank so, you. Thank you. It's, uh, yeah, I, it was a record that I I just found, and when I heard it, I'm like, oh man, okay, this is this is something else. So I That's amazing. I haven't had the time to sit down and lift it, but just so you know, I'll be stealing more Hugh bass lines. <laughs> Take them, please. A little, bit, a little bit later <laughs> down the road. Um, it's interesting to me when, um, you know, people that are great musicians and are able to, to play with other people, be successful as a sideman and also write and produce, just the overall approach. So for you, do you find that you, you come up with a certain part of a song before everything else and it's always the same or is a certain song set off by a melody and then a groove? What it, what's usually your process for that? I would say that it's never really the same. Yeah. Um, usually, usually it's, it's, I'll hear some kind of a melody yeah. in my head um, and I might go to a piano and figure out what the chords are and, and you know, I might take it a little further, or it might be something where I feel like it may be more than what I could handle, so I'll get somebody that, that can come in, yeah, and we'll work it out and see what it is. Yeah. But um, it's, it's never like really one way, like I don't have a, a template, like I use uh, Logic Pro. Yeah. I don't have a template set up to where, like some, some guys do that and it's fine. Yeah. Where they do it the same way every time. Yeah. I just kind of like, it's a feel. If, if, if something feels right, we, I start with it. It could be a, a keyboard part, it could be a bass part, you know? I might write, write lyrics to just a bass part or yeah. to just a keyboard part, 
you know, or to a drum groove. It might just be a groove, and then just kind of fill it in as nice. as I go along. Yeah, and having started out playing, you know, essentially playing in the studio when you were fairly young, a thing I'm always interested in is how people came to learn about pocket and whether that was something for you that it was, it, you know, did that naturally come about or did you get in the studio and all of a sudden, you know, it was like, ah, that doesn't sound quite right and had to sort of figure out where to put things in order to create that pocket. Uh, no, nah, it wasn't natural for me. No? No. I, I was definitely taught the concept by my dad nice. because when I was younger and he would put me in situations, whether it was to play on a record or to just jam with him at home in the studio, I was all over the place. Yeah. I'm, if I'm playing drums, I'm playing fills and I'm yeah. trying stuff and my dad would be like, little Hugh, come on, you gotta, you know, there's, play, play the same thing at least for a few measures. Yeah. And I used to get all upset and think he was being critical and, uh, so that was something that the concept was, was drilled into my head by my dad. Yeah. And eventually, once I understood that uh, he knew what he was talking about and that was real, um, yeah, it's instinct. It's, I, I feel that, you know? Yeah. It's just like a conversation. I'm gonna stop and allow you to speak and you're gonna stop and allow me to speak and it, it flows. Yeah. Music is the same thing. You know, sometimes you can sit with a person and they don't shut up. Yeah. Right? I was that kind of musician in the yeah. beginning. I wouldn't shut up. Yeah. And I, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think a lot of us go through that at a, at a certain age, right? It's that just trying to show everything you can do and not really paying attention. But we were kind of talking about it earlier and listen for that. You can tell when somebody else is going to go for something. And when you can hear that, all of a sudden, you know, to, you know if two people play a fill at the same time, it usually doesn't sound... Yeah. yeah, it's like you and I talking over each other, right? It just doesn't really work. So you have to go through. I think in a lot of ways you, with Pocket, you've kind of got to go through the experience of overplaying a little bit and have some other musicians be like, yeah. no, nah, that doesn't sound like... Either, you, usually either. when you're overplaying, you can do it with your friends that are overplaying too because nobody's really listening to each other. <laughs> exactly. But, but when you play with a couple other musicians and they, they're like, no, nah, that's not... Oh, they stop know. calling you. Yeah, you know? and then you, you find out, okay, well. Yeah, somebody tells you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I heard, you know, and you know, you gotta make the adjustments. Yeah, definitely. Because I know when I'm, when, I'm playing, when I'm playing drums. Yeah. If I'm playing with a bass player, um, it's almost a, I don't wanna say curse, that's kind of dramatic, but it, when you write and yeah. you produce, you hear everything. Yeah, because I'm I'm used to sitting with headphones, and when I when I produce or if I'm mixing, I you would think that something's wrong with me. Yeah, like, are you okay? <laughs> yeah. I'm not bopping my head. I'm not. Mo I'm still. I'm like, yeah. I'm just taking it in. You know. Yeah. Of course, there's you know there's periods where I'm into it and stuff, but when I'm really analyzing it, I'm taking it in. And sometimes on stage, if I'm playing drums, I I hear what everybody's doing. Including my own mistakes. I'm yeah. like, that was on you, Hugh. You know, I make yeah. them too. But yeah. sometimes it's, it's annoying. Sometimes you just want to play, right? Yeah. You just want to just enjoy it. But then, like I said, I have a very, very critical ear. Uh, not a judgmental ear, but I just, I, I hear everything. I mean, I, I hear when oh, the keyboard player, he didn't play his part. Or, so like when I put my band together, yeah. you know, if guys are trying to like, like, you know, leave parts out or, they didn't really learn the stuff. Yeah. They're not gonna fool me. Yeah. You might, you might fool me every once in a while on something really small, if, you know, if, if I'm really like, my attention is somewhere else, you know, in the show, but um, that's, I think that comes from, from writing songs and, and, and analyzing each part and making sure each part is right in the mix. Yeah. So now when I'm, when I'm on gigs and stuff, playing with different musicians, I'm, I analyze the parts. I can't help it. That's just just part of being a, a writer and a, and a producer. It's just I yeah. think I think that's what we do. Yeah, and something that's super interesting to me, as like as a, a guy playing both drums and bass, because to you know to me, what's comfortable playing in an R and B situation on bass is to be a bit behind the drums, like in the pocket, if the drums are on or even pushing a little bit, or if the hi hats just pushing. 
kind of driving the groove ahead, that feels really good. But to be able to make that switch from, you know, going as a, from the bass player that's going to be probably a little bit behind the groove or, you know, way behind depending on the track, to a drummer that's actually sort of pushing the time ahead, is, that's got to be a little bit of a, a switch to try and make in your head, I would think. But I don't have that experience. <laughs> I, I think it depends on the players that, you know, yeah. uh, I've been really fortunate Usually, whichever instrument that I'm playing, whether it's bass or drums, yeah. I play with really great musicians. So it's been a rare occasion where I'm playing, if I'm playing drums and I'm playing with a bass player, and I'm like, oh, God, or, or vice versa, you yeah. know, bass to drums. But um, to me, it's all about rhythm. It's like you, you asked me, I think, off camera about yeah. uh, my, my slap technique, which is yeah. weird because I'm not really, people, that come up to me, yeah. Uh, it's it's usually about the Erica record where yeah. I'm not really doing a whole lot of slapping. It's just more just in the pocket. Yeah. So if they once I start slapping or doing anything, they're like, "What are you doing? That's you're not supposed to be doing that." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. what I came up doing. You know that that was all I, you know, almost to a fault. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I had to stop. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and try to play finger style a little bit more. But yeah. When, um, that's actually, I guess that's an interesting question too for like, obviously, like you said, a lot of people know you for the Erica record and would ask about that. In your, like in your own mind, was there sort of a concept you gave yourself for playing bass on that record? Like in terms of, you know, I, I don't want to get too fancy with this or I want to stick to this kind of thing or did it, I mean, or did that just all sort of evolve from playing with Pooji and, and Keys? Um, with that record, I... What I remember most, not even just the record, just the gig. Yeah. Some of the songs, the bass lines were, they were simple bass lines. Yeah. So I would sometimes, especially in the beginning, but after, after we got into our groove and, you know, I understood what, what we were trying to do, I was fine. Yeah. But it took me a minute because some of the, some of the bass lines were very simple. So I would, I would be thinking sometimes, you got to do something. You, you, you yeah. got to add something. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I would try it, and I'm like, nah, it doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. need it. Yeah. So it took me a minute to relax and to understand. This song right here doesn't call for any slap. It doesn't call for any, you know, a whole bunch of runs, anything fancy. You know, I would always try to throw something in, something hopefully tasty here yeah. and there, but. Oh, there's lots of that on it. <laughs> What's that? There's lots of that on it. Well, thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you. But yeah. most importantly, I just, I remember realizing, play the groove, just, yeah. just stick to the groove. The melody is great, the, the vocalist, every, like we, we spoke before, everybody yeah. has a part. And as long as everybody's doing their part, yeah. you don't have to, to do anything extra because yeah. you kind of stick out. And then, then it's like, eh. Yeah, yeah, and it's just one thing too many. And, you know, yeah, obviously, uh, as, as a great a front person as you could really play behind at that point, too. So why, why distract from that in a lot of ways, too, right? So, exactly. Yeah. Um, sort of another interesting question. I've been asking people this. And it's interesting because some people can't come up with an answer because there's just uh -oh. too many. But Cut. I, li I like to find out from people if, uh, like, a record bass player, I call it a bass record, but if you had one Desert Island bass album, if you could only listen to one thing, what would that record be for you? Bass album? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it would probably be a, Oh, the Name is Bootsy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> I still throw that on. Yeah. You know, I, love I knew it was going to be a Bootsy record. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, there's so many records yeah. that I could name. Yeah, but, for sure. But Bootsy was just the biggest influence for me. Yeah. I just, even the way he, the way he spoke, yeah. you know, he also played drums. He was a phenomenal drummer, yeah. you know, in terms of, you know, his feel was yeah. incredible. And he would play, uh, the fills that he would play, they weren't just your typical, you know, you know, it was, yeah. it was off, it was syncopated, you know, he was just bootsy. Funky. Loved him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ah, absolutely. Um, 
I guess I, I've been asking people this question too, and it's an interesting answer a lot of the time, but um, I would have, you know, you've had a lot of really great musical experiences with a lot of great musicians. What are you, what are you most grateful for so far in the career that you've built? Um, playing with a lot of different musicians and seeing how they interpret uh, interpret the music differently. Like you could be on a gig and you can have um, a drummer come in. He might play it one way and it's like slamming, dope. Right? Yeah. Then another drummer will come in, play the same song, and he slams it a whole different kind of way. Yeah. Right. So that that teaches you not to get locked. Mm -hmm. The lesson is to be open, right? Yeah. Be open to other musicians and their input and, and just see what they got to say. You, you, don't, you never wanna like say, I can only play with this guy or I can only play with that girl or, or whomever, yeah. you know? You gotta be open and let people come to the gig and, and do their thing. Yeah. So I, I hope I answered the question. No, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what kind of things do you think young bass players should be working on right now when they're just kind of picking up the instrument? Okay. Uh, to any young bass players out there, just yeah. picking up the instrument. Yeah. In my uh, humble opinion, one of the most important things that you could work on would be your timing. Mm -hmm. Making sure that when you're playing that, hopefully three or four note groove, yeah. you, know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you're playing with other people, yeah. that you're consistent, that you know, you know the song, you know the arrangement, you're not switching up every other measure, <laughs> driving the drummer crazy, yeah. and then driving the singer crazy. Yeah. You know, just respect respect the uh, the composition. Yeah. And then once you know it, and once you know it inside out, then you can experiment here and there. You know, everyone trusts you at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't come in just owning the song that you didn't write. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Guns blazing. And exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. You've also got a record of your own coming out right now. First single's coming out soon called Dati Da. Yes. Uh, tell us a bit about that record. Dati Da. That will be available on the 27th this coming Friday. Nice. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting song because it wasn't originally called Dati Da. Okay. It was called Groove With Me. Nice. And I had more vocal on it and I had chants and I had, you know, just all kind of stuff going on. And for the smooth jazz genre, you kind of have to, especially as a new artist, I'm considered a new artist even though I'm, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm an old boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just can't come in doing, you know, your thing, the, the way that you, you, you uh, exactly hear it. Sometimes you gotta, you gotta check out the format and see what it is. Yeah. And I think that it, it had too much of a vocal on it and I almost scrapped the whole song. Okay. And I start working on other stuff, but then I, I just really loved the track. And I said, you know what, I, I gotta come up with, with, with another hook, just something else that, that's catchy. And I, I just kept hearing that rhythm, you know, with da di da and, and doesn't, mean, doesn't really mean anything. da di da can mean whatever you want it to mean. Yeah. You could be like, man, he played the da di da out of that bass Yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. Uh, Man, I'm I'm so pissed off, man. Yeah. Da -de da, yeah. you know, whatever you want, <laughs> yeah. however you want to use it. Yeah. And um, so far, uh, I've been getting a pretty good reception, you know. Yeah. So yeah, we will sure. see. Nice. We will see. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I know it went for uh, for ads on smooth smooth jazz radio, so it's I got a few ads. Nice. So we'll see. Oh, we cool. will see. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> And I guess actually as an, as an artist, that would be some interesting input, kind of having seen a bunch of different sides of the music industry. Aside from bass players, what advice would you give to any artist that's just trying to make their way in an industry that, like we talked about, has kind of massively changed since either of us got into it at different points? Uh, I would say, like coming up back in the day, you know, there was record companies, there were, you know, managers and agents and people that, that took care of everything yeah. pretty much for you. You were the creative force and you did your job. Now you kind of have to do everything or at least you have to find the people that you want to help represent you. 
Yeah. So you got to be knowledgeable. You can't just know your instrument and music. You got to know, you know, some some business things. There's some things that you have to investigate. You know, you got to learn about your your publishing, your writing, your uh, licensing your music. You know, um, distribution. Yeah. Uh, there's just so many different things that you got to investigate and look into. So I would say, especially for the young kids, because they master everything now. They get on computers, they master them, they're mastering, you know, they're learning all their skills and doing all this stuff at a high, use, like we, we spoke off camera, these yeah. 12 and 13 year old musicians, they can play anything. Yeah. So learn the business. If you can master the, all of that other stuff, try to master the business, which you'll never, you never will, because there's always you yeah. know, something to learn. And always evolving. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, that opportunity to just be an artist that somebody finds and picks up is kind of diminishing all the time right now. So it, it is, you know, we have, we've got lots of great tools to be able to do everything yourself, like you said, but it's knowing what to do with them is, is the thing that people have to get down, I think, at this point. So. That and knowing yeah. when to step back. Sometimes yeah. I think people, they try to do too much. Yeah. You know, it's like you do what you can handle and what you're, what you're good or great at. But if you're not great at something, don't do yourself a disservice and just do it just because you can. Get somebody else that can really do it the right way. Yeah. So you don't end up doing it twice or three times down the line. Well, I think that's a, a good spot to leave off on. And man, so great to meet you. Thanks My for pleasure, coming man. down, man. Yeah, Anytime. Anytime. Right yeah. yeah.